banished from death. Then how do we break this curse? We find the one who cast it on us. Celebrimbor is your curse. And he can release you at any time. Ever since I played War in the North, I've had low expectations for all future Lord of the Rings games. That is, until Shadow of Mordor broke into the opinion lobe of my brain SWAT team style and battering rammed its way into my top 10 favorite games list. You know, that's actually a little extreme. I'd say more like top 50 favorite games list. Before Monolith Studios introduced us to its newborn baby in 2014, Lord of the Rings games didn't stand out for a long time. There was War in the North, which kind of went unnoticed because it wasn't a very good game to begin with, but it was also 2011, and everyone and their mother was hyped for the release of bigger games, like The Elder Scrolls V, Dead Space 2, and Batman Arkham City. Speaking of Batman, I'll be getting back to this game in a minute. There was Aragorn's Quest, released in 2010, and from what I've heard, it was a pretty shitty game. But then... We got those sweet LEGO games. LEGO Lord of the Rings in 2012 and LEGO The Hobbit in 2014, which was a good step in the right direction. Even though it was based on the movies, it did feel fresh because it's fucking LEGO. But Monolith Studios knew that even though LEGO games are epic, we would need some badass M-rated game to get the testosterone flowing and get some hair on our nuts and or vagina flaps. And what better way to do this than to release Shadow of Mordor only 5 months after the LEGO Hobbit rolled out the red carpet. Shadow of Mordor was developed by Monolith Studios and published by Warner Brothers. The game won over 50 Game of the Year awards. That's 50 more awards than I've ever won, so you know it must be pretty damn good. The game starts off with the typical Lord of the Rings intro. Some narration about some shit to give the player some info about the lore of current or past events. And there's a really annoying voice piggybacking on the narrator. Where the shadows lie. Listen my guy, you need to shut up and be your own person. We're introduced to the protagonist of the game, Talion. He's a ranger of Gondor, has a loving wife, and a Durhaya. But in a blink of an eye, it was all taken from him. Good, get that soft lovey-dovey shit out of here. Talion is killed and the game ends. I give this game a perfect score, 10 out of 10. But wait, he gets banished from death? An elf who is either a ghost or a wraith, I'm not quite clear on the difference, tells us just that. What has happened to me? You are banished from death. Oh, hell no! We learn later in the story that his name is Celebrimbor. None of these two actually know his name right now, but for ease of reference, I'm gonna call him by his name. I figure it's better than calling him the cunt. We also learn that the Black Hand of Sauron has put a curse on the duo, and they are bound together by the curse. Celebrimbor tells Talion that they must find the Black Hand of Sauron to undo the curse, and then the introduction ends. As I sat in my chair looking at my computer screen, drinking Doritos and eating Mountain Dew, I was googling all kinds of words to find the perfect word to describe the gameplay. And nothing felt right, so fuck it. The gameplay of Shadow of Mordor is fun, it's addicting, and it makes you feel like a god. Once you reach a higher level, of course. When I was 13, I didn't know how video game companies worked. I thought a company would make one series of games, and if they wanted to make another series, they would have to change their name. Don't ask me why I thought this was the way things worked. I was a dumb kid back then. I didn't even know what sperm was until the seventh grade, so, you know. So anyway, when I played Shadow of Mordor at first, I didn't like it because my first experience with a game published by Warner Brothers that had this combat system was Batman Arkham Asylum. And so when I played Shadow of Mordor, I eventually stopped playing it because I didn't want to support a game company that obviously stole Batman's combat system. 
And so, the game faded out of thought and time, until some years later when I was 17, and I bought the Game of the Year edition. I played it for a little while, but at that time, Battle Royale games came out and I hopped on the Fortnite train. Yeah, I know, haha, <laughs> virgin, haha, <laughs> shut up. So I put the game away for another two years, and then when I was 19, I regained my love of single player games, so I decided to try it once again. Shadow of Mordor's gameplay uses a blend of head on in your face, let me decapitate you real quick melee combat, a stealth system, and the ranged combat. One thing that I absolutely love about Shadow of Mordor is that the upgrade tree, or trees, actually has useful upgrades. These grant you whole new abilities or build upon previously unlocked upgrades. The amount of upgrades can feel overwhelming at first glance, but quickly get ingrained into your muscle memory after using the abilities a couple times. Every upgrade feels helpful and necessary, but unfortunately the game doesn't always explain stuff very well, so abilities that I initially thought were kinda useless actually turn out to be super useful. For example, after I witnessed the pitiful amount of damage output the dagger did, I thought Celebrimbor was a scam artist for tricking me into buying such a useless ability. But when I was playing in the DLC after I beat the base game, I found that it's actually a very good counter to shield cunts, which really would have saved me a headache in the base game. And I'm pretty sure I even had tutorials on, so you know what, fuck you, that's, 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 a, that's some negative score right there. A game like Far Cry will have very situational upgrades that you'll use only a handful of times, if at all in the entire playthrough. Even in Dying Light, there's a skill where you can craft some like boosters to give you certain bonuses, but I never used the upgrade because it seemed kinda pointless. So this game gets bonus points for having good upgrades. Upgrade points like any other game are earned through the collection of XP. XP is earned by completing quests or through the reduction of Mordor's population. Not too hard when you're fighting the mentally challenged. The Ranger skill tree focuses on Talion's abilities and are mostly combat related while the Wraith Tree focuses on Celebrimbor's abilities, and is a mix of combat and non-combat abilities. Upgrade tiers are locked and can only be unlocked after gaining a certain amount of power points, or PP. You can obtain PP by completing main missions, killing chieftains, or looking like this. Although, taking the chieftain route takes a while, since they're harder to kill in early game, and they don't always give a nice chunk of power points. So it's a nice way of deterring the player from going on a captain grind and becoming overpowered way too early. And if you're thinking about going on a captain grind, don't. Because if you become too powerful too early, then there's nothing to work towards besides beating the game. And you don't play Shadow of Mordor for the story, so do yourself a favor and slow down, partner. Speaking of that, the amount of XP and PP you need also increases with each level. So again, it'll be a huge grind. There's also the attributes, or attributes, whatever the fuck it's called, skill tree, where you can upgrade your health, focus, elf shot, and rune slots for your three weapons. It can be earned by finding collectibles, selling runes, completing bonus objectives and missions, and are rewarded for completing side missions and challenges. My only complaint with the upgrade system is that some of the upgrades are unlocked in super late game, and at that point, because you're so powerful, they're as useful as your grandmother's uterus. Seriously, the ability to ride Graugs and counter Karagors gets unlocked in the last like 4 or 5 missions, and by that point I already did all the side missions, collected all the collectibles, and the remaining missions don't even have Karagors or Graugs. Aside from that, the upgrades are all pretty good. I'm not too sure what they're teaching the Rangers of Gondor over at Ranger School, but all I can say is bravo. If Boromir would have been able to do half the moves that Talion could do, he could have simply walked into Mordor. Combat in Shadow of Mordor is the selling point of the game. The way Talion kills the Uruks is brutally effective. 
Not only that, but he has extreme emotional control. Talion can commit mass genocide and not even show the slightest sign of PTSD. I guess you can't have traumatic stress if you are the traumatic event. You think Celebrimbor would be impressed, or maybe even a little scared. Maybe say something along the lines of, bruh. But no, he just says, Nani here, Gelar Mordor. The variety of ways in which you can kill the Uruks keeps things feeling fresh. Depending on both Talion's position and the Uruks position, he will do a different kill move on them, so it's not the same animation being played over and over again. The one thing that really makes my nipples hard are those goddamn combat executions. Charging your hit counter leaves Uruks vulnerable to these insta-kills, and there's a fuck ton to perform. But my personal favorites are the Roly Poly Oli and the Trachea Brachia. Using the bow puts you in the Wraith world. Your focus meter will drain over time, but make sure to keep an eye on the bar because once it runs out, everything is back to normal speed again and at that point you're basically fucked. Stealth in video games can usually get pretty boring, especially if you have a trash attention span, but that's probably because in other video games you have guns and explosives. So poking a bad guy with a sharp piece of steel just doesn't have that same effect as filling their bellies full of lead and leaving a pool of their own blood to drown in. Am I right, Marines? Sir, yes, sir! Mm -hmm. Damn right I am. But since this is a Lord of the Rings game, there's no guns, no explosives, and no point in continuing to play the game. Get out of here with your no guns bullshit, fucking pussy ass swords and knives game. Stealth will never be as fun as direct combat, but in Shadow of Mordor, it's viable and almost as fun as direct combat. Especially since there are so many different ways to approach a stealth encounter. You can be sneaky from above, sneaky from below, sneaky in the bushes, sneaky by the bonfire. And you think if the orcs heard some whispering coming from some bushes and they went to investigate, they would get their buddies to back them up, but nah. That would make the game way too realistic. Oh, I forgot to mention that you actually have the force in this game. Who thought it was a good idea to replace this awesome animation after an interrogation with this one? Just a little complaint I thought I'd throw in there. The way the Uruks behave and interact with the world around them is pretty fun to witness. The Uruks hate each other almost as much as they hate men, elves, and dwarves. Captains will fight and kill each other to take a higher ranking captain's place. And if you poison a barrel of grog, they'll all gather around for a friendly drink, but when one of them dies, instead of thinking it was the Gravewalker, they'll just assume it was another Uruk and they'll start to kill each other. They chase escaped slaves, fight Karagors, fight ghouls, or even piss for one minute straight. That is one big bladder. They'll even run, run away in fear if you explode an enemy's head or brutalize a nearby Uruk. You can't really blame them for it. I'm sure if a human saw an orc kill a human like this, they would probably tuck tail and flee in terror too. Uruks are easy enough to kill on their own or in small groups, but their real strength comes from their numbers and different enemy types. The warrior Uruk is the most common enemy in the game. They're easy to kill and are overconfident. The Berserker is like that one orc from the Skyrim loading screen with two axes. They can't be attacked directly or else they smack your buns. You can counter them, but you still want to kill them sooner than later, so send them first and finish them off quickly. Defenders have shields, and the wooden ones can be broken, but the metal ones can't. So they can't always be attacked head on, and you can't counter them, so dodge, vault over them, or use throwing daggers. These guys take top priority in any fight because they're just so fucking annoying to deal with. I like to either execute them immediately or pull out my bow and headshot them right in the face. You can also use that tackle skill to break shields with a shoulder charge, but I always thought you had to hold RB, but you actually just have to press it. Unfortunately, I didn't clue in and just thought the skill was useless. Turns out I was the useless one.
Ranged orcs were created for the sole purpose of pissing the player off. Your only counter to the spears they throw is to move out of the way, and when you're in a group of uruks, there's too much to look at and because they're fairly accurate, they'll whittle down your health in a fight. Finally, the last uruk type, the captains. You know how I was saying the combat is so fun because of the variety of different ways to kill shit? Well the uruks in this game are also full of variety, especially the captains. Every captain has a different name that usually relates to their appearance. They all have different strengths and weaknesses, so no two bosses are ever the same. Maybe after you kill so many, there's captains who get reused, but I never experienced this in my playthrough. Lower powered captains have more weaknesses and provide less power points for the player. These captains can be a challenge in early game, especially in groups, but in late game they become pretty easy. But that's where the higher powered captains become a problem. They may be invincible to stealth, invincible to ranged attacks, and combat masters, so finishers don't hurt them. So at this point you may be thinking, he's invincible, I can't kill him, this game is rigged. Well young grasshopper, that's where the intel comes in handy. Interrogating any Uruk will reveal an unknown captain's identity, but only by interrogating worms, talking to certain slaves, Participating in necrophilia or awkwardly reading some papers will reveal a captain's strengths and weaknesses. This can really make a captain immensely easier because higher powered captains can only be killed if their fears have been exploited. They may have a fear of fire, Morgai flies, Karagors, Graugs, or even Talion himself. When their fears have been exploited, the skull above their head will turn green indicating that they can be grabbed. This may be your only chance to kill them so throw them off the nearest cliff or prison shank them until they die. When a boss dies, they will always drop something called a weapon rune. Weapon runes are buffs that you can apply to your weapon that give Talion bonuses in combat. There's many different runes to choose from, so you can play around with them to suit your playstyle. A single weapon can hold up to 5 runes at once, provided you've unlocked all the slots. So you can have a lot of mini bonuses, or select a few duplicate runes of various levels to optimize a preferred bonus. The best runes are legendary runes, which are extremely rare and can pretty much only be consistently obtained by issuing death threats against captains or killing war chiefs. Some runes are automatically gifted in the Game of the Year edition of the game, but personally I only used one or two legendary runes to avoid being overpowered too early. Anyways, enough about runes. The best part about the captains is their little combat intros. I don't feel pain, so I don't feel fear. What have you got? One thing I thought was cool about this game is that the bad guys are aware of the fact that you respawn and the captains will actually comment about it when they fight you again. Mate! It usually only takes one death, but then, what do I know of the world? It reminds me of Dark Souls how dying is a part of the game's lore, and as an undead, you never really die from defeat in battle, you only die, or go hollow, when you give up and lose hope. However, it's pretty odd how there's no real penalty for dying in this game. Of the few times I have died in this game, either from Karagor insta-kills, or attempting to fast travel to China, I noticed that when you die, you actually gain experience points. The captain who killed you does get an increase in power, but this only really benefits you since you'll be killing them and getting more power points. You can ride Karagors, which is cool at first, but quickly gets old. You can ride Graugs, which is pretty awesome, but only in super late game. It's still fun, but it would be way more useful in early game. And lastly, you can unlock these special abilities where, when activated, you can do infinite executions, infinite stealth kills, or infinite ranged attacks. I only ever used them at the end of the game, not because I needed to, but because up until that point, I never used them so I wanted to see what they are all about. A cool idea, but with the amount of time it takes to build a hit streak, it isn't really practical unless you're fighting a fuck ton of Uruks.
Shadow of Mordor has a decent amount of side content. Nowhere near as much as a Ubisoft game, but still enough to keep you busy. The base game's side missions are the same missions repeated 24 times, so it does get just a little repetitive. And when I say a little repetitive, I don't mean Halo CE library repetitive. I mean, I fucking hate these missions. Why is every single one the same thing? And why did they think anyone would enjoy doing it more than 5 times, let alone 20 fucking 4? Every slave mission has the same formula. Go to a location, set free the exact same guy over and over again until the mission ends. The only reason I did them all was to get 100% completion. But there is one thing that I appreciate so much about the Shadow of Mordor campaign that I couldn't not at least touch on it. This makes both the main and side missions 10 times more fun to complete. These are, of course, the bonus objectives. I know bonus objectives aren't anything new in video games, but I always went out of my way to complete them since they're done so well in Shadow of Mordor. It changes the way you approach every situation, whether it be a stealth, melee, or ranged approach. And I think more video games should try to implement what Shadow of Mordor does. I know I keep comparing aspects of this game to Far Cry 3, but it's all I can think of at the moment. So, in Far Cry 3, you get bonus XP, usually a thousand, if you take over an outpost stealthily. Since I was awarded for playing the game a specific way, why would I ever want to tackle it any other way if I knew I would be missing out on bonus experience points? Of course it didn't always go as planned, but I always tried to be stealthy about it so I could get that bonus XP. And that's exactly why I love the bonus objectives in this game. It rewards the player for handling situations differently than how we normally would. I may be making a bigger deal about bonus objectives than I should, but I appreciate what it does in terms of gameplay. 10 out of 10. There's hunting and survival challenges, nothing really to say about these. There's 10 of each challenge in the game, and you just have to go around Mordor, killing a specific amount of different creatures, or go on a scavenger hunt for different plants. You don't get anything for finishing them all, except for an achievement. Then there's the collectibles. The artifacts spread around the world tell stories about the past of characters we meet and people whose names Talion will never know. We learn about what motivates these characters and why they do what they do. Some stories were more interesting than others, but you start to see that in Mordor, there are no happy endings. Well, except for Talion's second chance at life. Finally, there's no one to stop him from building up his plant collection. Ethilden, if I'm pronouncing that right, are elven runes scattered around the map that provide you with Mirian and some elven writing. It's cool seeing the wall come together to make a picture, but again, all you get for collecting all the artifacts and all the Ethilden is an achievement. There's also a button prompt for Celebrimbor to read the writing, but it's kind of boring. Vendetta missions are only accessible if you have Xbox Live or PS Plus, because us console scrubs have to actually pay money to play online. Fuck both companies for doing this. Apparently buying the console and video game isn't enough. No, now we have to go and pay to play the game too. Everyone's saying Xbox is better or PlayStation is better. I say fuck them both. Anyways, it's fun to do these and avenge players, especially when you get the chance to avenge your friends and show them how much better you are at the game than they are. The side missions that are actually fun in this game are the Sword, Bow, and Dagger Legend missions. Unlike the Slave missions, every one of these Legend missions are different than the previous, so doing them are actually fun and not a chore. The Bow Legends are my least favorite of the three, but my favorite Legend mission is actually a Bow Legend. But it's because there's a couple of Uruks running away from a Graug, and you have to pin their feet in place so the Graug can kill them. Kinda fucked up, but I loved every second of it. Finishing half of a weapon's legends will change the appearance of the weapon, and completing all 10 of a weapon's legends will change the appearance again. The sword legends are all about killing a certain number of Uruks in a certain way with the sword, but the best sword legend is the one where you can't let any torchbearer Uruks cross the bridge. I had so much fun doing it 
that I purposely let a torchbearer cross the bridge, just so I could do it all over again. The bow legends are all about killing shit with the bow, and of course, the dagger legends are all about killing Uruks from the shadows. Half of the DLC is meh, and the other half is, in my opinion, better than the last half of the base game. The DLC that's not really cool is the Nemesis Forge and the Trials of War. The Nemesis Forge is just killing Uruk captains and war chiefs. You can build up a Nemesis, but it doesn't really explain too well how it works, and I didn't care enough to really try to figure out how, because it was pretty boring. The Trials of War is actually pretty fun. You have a few categories to choose from, like Test of Speed, Test of Power, Endless Challenge, etc. Basically, you choose a category that makes your nipples hard, and then you try to complete the challenge with the best score possible. I had fun with this, but it's not something I see myself coming back to very often. You can also choose from different costumes, which is pretty cool. Oh wait, what? What? What the fuck? The Lord of the Hunt campaign is about teaming up with Torvin again, a character we meet later in the game, to take out specialized beast hunter captains and war chiefs. If you really enjoyed the mounted combat in the base game, but didn't get to use it enough, then you're in luck. Because this campaign is full of beast riding, and there's some new beasts like the Karagath, which is a stealth Karagor, and it even looks cooler than a normal Karagor, and my personal favorite, the Wretched Graug. The Wretched Graug trades in the ability to stomp for a vomit attack, and a projectile vomit attack, which kills Uruks in one hit, so this version of the Graug is badass and fun as fuck to use. 10 out of 10. The other campaign is called the Bright Lord, and you get to play as Celebrimbor right after he stole the ring from Sauron. Hands down the best DLC, because you get to use the Ring of Power, and it unlocks the ability to slow down time, become invisible, and you gain access to unlimited executions and fire arrows. Because Celebrimbor isn't the Wraith at this point, you lose access to focus mode when using the bow, but it makes up for it by not needing you to draw back the bow to get the most powerful shot. You can still use Wraith World, but you can just relate this back to the movies. Because in the movies, the wearer of the ring goes into the Wraith World, so boom. Perfectly logical explanation. The missions in this campaign are all about building your army to challenge Sauron. You even get to communicate with Sauron himself, which is pretty epic. Both DLC campaigns contain extra lore to gather, fun side missions that aren't repetitive Free the Slave missions, and a decent amount of main missions, so the DLC, in my opinion, is one of the best parts of the game. I'll be honest here, the story itself isn't the best, but it's also not the worst. It's a revenge story that takes place in the Lord of the Rings universe, and even though the story isn't too great, the characters do make up for it somewhat. So, quick recap of the intro. Bad guys attack the Black Gate, the hammer uses his hammer, the big cheese kills Talion's family, oh no, and finally Talion himself. Apparently he fast travels to Mordor, interrogates a nearby orc, discovering that he recently sold one of his boy toy sex slaves to Gimub the Slaver. The slave claims to have fought the Black Hand himself, so Talion goes to rescue him and hopefully find some answers. He kills Gimub and finds the slave, but turns out he's just a big fat pussy and ran away from the Black Hand. Here Gon tells Talion to find him at his base without telling him where it is. But Talion does that video game thing where the main character will just know where the base is. Gollum reveals himself to us, and now we have three choices on which storyline we want to pursue. I'll briefly explain each storyline, because they aren't particularly exciting, except for Ratbag's storyline. Gollum's storyline is pretty much mainly composed of fetch quests. Basically, go to place, find an artifact, learn something about the Wraith's past, and beat up Gollum. <laughs> He only helps us because he thinks Celebrimbor will show him where the ring is because at this point Bilbo Baggins still has the ring. Through these missions, we learn that the Wraith's name is Celebrimbor and he crafted the Rings of Power. Usually after we obtain an artifact, something goes horribly wrong, like a Karagor attacks, a Grog is gonna fuck us up, or Gollum molests Talion. 
Hyrgon's missions are pretty fun, but I wish there was a button prompt to slap Hyrgon in the fucking mouth, because something about him just really annoys me. Maybe because he's a ginger cunt? His missions are all about causing chaos in Sauron's army, usually from the shadows. He teaches Talion how to poison grog barrels, and this mission gets annoying because if you get spotted, you automatically fail the mission. Not too bad, but when you poison a grog barrel, a couple of Uruk spawn and you barely have enough time to get away unseen. In the other mission, you have to destroy a statue of Sauron to draw out the hammer, but I want to talk more about that later. Ratbag's missions are hands down the best in the game. His character is actually hilarious, and when his missions end, the main missions are just never the same. The first time we encounter him, he's tied up and left for dead. He tells Talion that if he frees him, he'll help him take out the Black Hand by climbing through the ranks and becoming a war chief. His missions always involve killing captains and war chiefs, and at the end of the first mission with Ratbag, he orders these two Uruks to bring Goroth's body back to his tent and to meet him at some crossroads. Bonus points if you kill the two Uruks immediately after the cutscene. The next time you meet him, you have to save him from getting his head chopped off, and the Uruks are actually making puns. Talion kills Brog the twin, and Ratbag takes his ear so he can become the War Chief's bodyguard and kill him for Talion. Talion goes on a murder spree, killing the War Chiefs one by one until only Mog the twin remains. This is our last encounter with Ratbag, and the game story gets meh from here. It's not horrible, it's it's just not the same without Ratbag. Talion draws out and kills Mog, and then Ratbag becomes a war chief. The next two missions are super enjoyable. With all of the war chiefs dead and Ratbag on our team, Kyrgon and the outcasts are ready to draw out the Black Hand. In order to do so, he's devised a plan to destroy the monument of Sauron using a cart of Grog. Not sure how fire will destroy a statue made of stone, but let's see what happens, shall we? There's some Uruks guarding the Grog cart, and we clear them out so the boys can safely push the cart. Hyrgon and Talion spend the next few minutes sneaking around and dispatching foes until the boys push the cart close to the monument. Finally, the boys have to push the cart to the objective marker while Talion defends them from the Uruks. And then the game decides to smoothly transition to an orc archer who's pretty calm about the whole situation. But then we push the cart one pixel too far and he's had enough, so he fires a bolt at the wagon, ensnaring the cart in flames. For the duration of the mission, we have to push the cart ourselves while defending against orc archers. The cart has a health bar, so it does add a sense of urgency to hurry the hell up and push the cart, but the health bar barely goes down. I could have went and made a meatball sub in the time it would have taken for the cart to blow, but I didn't realize this until I pushed the cart all the way to the destination. Thankfully, the orcs already placed TNT all along the structure, easily allowing us to destroy the monument. In the next mission, Hyrgon and all of his comrades escape via some secret tunnel, and this is the last we see of Hyrgon in the game. The hammer shows up to where we destroyed the monument, and he's quite the opposite of happy. This is the last we see of Ratbag because I'm assuming he fucking destroys him with the hammer, but who knows, maybe he managed to survive. Honestly, at best he would be a paraplegic, so I wouldn't really count on it. Talion confronts the hammer, and they reminisce about the good old days. Ranger from the Black Gate. Where was your bravery when we bled your wife and gutted your son? I was very happy with the way this boss fight turned out. It's really just a beefed out captain, but it's way better than future boss fights which I'll get to a little later. The hammer uses a variety of attacks from normal counterable strikes, telekinetic AoE attacks, and moves that can only be dodged. Every 5 seconds he makes some cliche statement or taunts Talion. It's quite difficult to consistently slap them titties, so you pretty much have to use the surrounding bad guys to build up the hit counter and perform executions on him until eventually you're ready to deal the death blow. Unfortunately for me, the wooden planks got in the way of his death speech, so it didn't quite have that same effect that I think the developers were going for. Talion releases his finishing blow to the hammer and concludes the boss fight. Overall, it was a very enjoyable fight. 8 out of 10. 
After the defeat of the Hammer, a woman by the name of Lothariel rudely interrupts Talion's conversation with Celebrimbor. Also, I'd like to point out that Talion is pretty much a zombie at this point in time. He's been hanging out with the Wraith who resurrected him, he has superpowers, and he himself can see visions when he touches artifacts. And despite all of this, he's in disbelief that this queen can see visions? She has seen visions of your misfortune. <laughs> Queen who sees visions. Why is that so strange to Talion, but everything else up until this point is totally normal? Seems to me like Rangers of Gondor aren't qualified based on their intelligence. When the blonde bitch mentions Celebrimbor, he agrees to go to the island of Nern with her. For the rest of the game, most of the missions are devoted to helping this chick, and this is where the story goes from acceptable, or even on the verge of good, to meh. Lothariel isn't a very interesting character. The only thing interesting about her are those titties, but we never even get to see them. So she remains as an uninteresting character needed for plot continuation. Talion prepares to leave for the Sea of Nernan. Lothariel told us the journey there would be long, but it only took a few seconds. So far, she's lied to us and hasn't showed us her breasts, so my opinion of her shies away from positivity every passing second. While vegetation is a rarity in the land of Nern, the island of Nernan is lush with greenery. There's thick trees and green meadows to frolic in for as far as the eye can see. There's even a beautiful, roaring ocean, like, damn. Despite the differences in appearance, this island is more dangerous than the starting map. The Uruks travel in much larger packs, Karagors travel in packs, and there's even a stronger new Karagor type, and the Graugs seem to be more common as well. Now, I could talk about the main story from here until the end of the game for over 10 minutes, but the story just isn't good enough to care about, so here comes a quick summary. Talion meets woman's mom, who is ooey pooey gross, you don't touch me, and obviously under a spell like Theoden was in the Two Towers. We go to Gull Cave, Hammer Time, Flashback Time, Sauron makes the ring, we leave before the ghouls can detonate their C4, Short Man becomes Friend Man, and now we have two storylines to follow. Torvins or Lotharials. Torvins' missions don't really contribute to Talion's revenge story since we just hunt beasts in them and learn to ride Graugs. Pretty much the only important thing is we get Celebrimbor's chisel and another flashback. Sauron mind controls Celebrimbor using the ring so he can make the ring prettier by engraving some writing. Torvin dies, we kill Grau King, Torvin's alive, bye bye Torvin. And that's the end of Torvin's quest line. Lothariel's quests are about helping the damsel in distress and have very little to do with progressing the plot towards Talion's revenge. So again, summary time. The queen says, you need army. Talion, I don't know how. Queen, Go to place and you learn. We go to fortress, we learn how. Death time. We find an artifact and Sauron's like, Time to die, little elf. And Celebrimbor's like, Yeah, for you, motherfucker. <laughs> the orcs lead his family away and Celebrimbor is restrained, unable to do anything to save himself or his family. All he can do is cooperate. Talion returns to the exorcist. She sends us away to brand the war chiefs. We brand them all, and we even have to use the pagan min strategy to draw out a war chief. Go on, cry for help. Cry for help. Help? Oh, pathetic. No, cry for help. Help! You mean it, boy. Help! help! From your diaphragm! Help! help! Shh, 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 shh. Now we listen. <laughs> The exorcist performs an exorcism on us, but Lothariel breaks the staff and the queen becomes a MILF. Filler missions. The boys and I gather up and set sail to Uden so we can go to war. The Uruk captain gives a good speech. Beyond the dust is the man who walks with death, and his army are traitors. He has poisoned their minds and defies our dark lord. Join me in slaughter, brothers! Our destiny awaits! Talion gives a crappy speech to his army. Drown the air with Uruk cries and the earth with Uruk blood! 
Why is our army made up of only war chiefs? The fuck? We kill everyone, confront the tower, and learn some disturbing new evidence. The Black Hand didn't curse Talion. Celebrimbor did. Boss fight time. And it's a step down from the hammer boss fight. Really, only three stealth brands and then a button prompt? Fun. The boss fight sucked, but the way he killed the tower is pretty awesome. And now it's time for the final mission. Talion enters the Queen's home, and it's been ransacked by the Black Hand. Surprisingly, Gollum is here, probably hitched a ride with the Black Hand ship, and he hands Talion another artifact that he protected from the servants of the Dark Lord. Good boy, Smeagol. We see that Celebrimbor stole the ring from Sauron. That's also the start of the Bright Lord campaign. Gollum tries to kill us because I guess he can see the visions too, and he knows Celebrimbor stole it. Talion makes his way back to Udun to confront the Black Hand. As we ride through Mordor, we can see branded Uruks fighting. Clearly we do have an army now, so hey, epic. We have to battle 5 war chiefs and some lesser Uruks. Nothing new, new here, just kill them all. Talion climbs to the top of the Black Gate where the Black Hand is waiting for us. He uses his telekinetic telepathy shit and reveals to us the final flashback. Celebrimbor has gathered an army of orcs to challenge Sauron. He starts off well, combining his own skills with the power of the ring. He's like, yeah, you can't touch me, pussy. Whoop. Oh no! Is it too late for Sari? <laughs> Powerless to stand against Sauron, Celebrimbor is forced to watch as his family is killed, and finally, he too gets murdered. The Dark Hand sucks Celebrimbor, and Talion is now vulnerable to death. Once again, the boss fight is fucking dog shit, but I'm gonna give it a pass because we don't have Celebrimbor with us, so Talion doesn't have any of his wraith powers from gameplay right now. With Celebrimbor's help, he kills the Black Hand. Honestly, I really didn't enjoy the story that much, but the ending made me excited for Shadow of War because it sounds like Celebrimbor is telling Talion it's time to let go and join his family, but he wants to stay on Middle-earth and try to kill Sauron while he's vulnerable. Obviously, based on the movies, we know that his plan failed, but hey, you know, it's pretty nice. Celebrimbor is like, oh, it can't be done, but Talion says, it's time to make a new ring, bitch, which I would assume he's going to use it to combat Sauron. Making a ring is perfectly doable since he has Celebrimbor with him and all of his tools, but we all know what happens when a man uses a ring of power. He becomes the Nazgul. Ah, let's see, criticisms. Well, the characters were pretty bland, so I didn't care about them at all. By bland characters, I mean Hyrgon, Lothariel, and the Queen, but I love the Radbag, Celebrimbor, and Torvin. Nothing but good times with these lads. Talion wasn't anything special either. He's very stuck up, but hey, if my throat got slit and my family died, I guess I wouldn't be too enthusiastic about life either. Honestly, his end dialogue is the only time I really thought that he was cool, and I'm sure I'll come to like him more in Shadow of War. Especially because there's like over 50 hours of story, so I'm that's that's a that's a step up. There, there's some skills that are unlocked in late game, which kind of made them useless at that point. The skills themselves are useful and fun, they just should have been unlocked more around the middle of the game. Uh, fuck the slave missions, these are all pieces of shit. Why does Talion's sword revert back to normal in cutscenes? And why the fuck does Torvin tame Karagors by literally stabbing them in the back? The boss fight with the tower and the dark hand were steps down from the hammer boss fights, so that was pretty lame. But those are my only real complaints with the game, but other than that, it's a pretty cool game. 7.5 out of 10. Bye bye for now, and Merry Christmas.